YouTube family, listen, man, this is this is a message you're about to hear from a series I just started called I'm Building Something. Listen to me. Man, this was the first sermon at our first service for our Change Atlanta location, man. We're in Atlanta every Sunday, 9 a.m., 11.15 a.m. Uh, in Duluth, Georgia, actually. And so this message, man, is called It's Up From Here. If it adds value to you, share it with somebody. Come on, this is our first Sunday morning in Atlanta. Y'all talk back to the preacher on Sunday morning here. Okay. So I teach in series. I believe we learn through repetition. To, so I take a certain subject and we explore some of the things the Bible has to say about that subject over a period of weeks. And I'm beginning a series here for the next four weeks. And uh, this series is entitled, I'm Building Something. And so I want to read a verse, a few verses of scripture found um, in the book of Genesis chapter number 6 and I'm going to begin reading at verse number 14 the scripture is going to be on the screens for you and this is what it says it says so make yourself an ark of cypress wood make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out I'm just going to stop there I'm ready to preach um, let's talk from this subject in our time together it's up from here Clap your hands if you're ready for God's word. It's, it's, up, from, it's up from here. I, I want to begin our time of teaching by informing some and reminding others of a truth that I think is extremely important yet often overlooked, and that truth is this. Listen to me. God's got plans for you. I say this not as some church colloquialism. I'm not giving you religious rhetoric. I'm not trying to provide you with some biblical nursery rhyme. I say that with confidence because I eavesdrop on a conversation that God had with his people through a gentleman named Jeremiah. And he said to his people through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, 11, these words. He said, for I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I think what's so profound about this phrase isn't just what God says, it's when God says it. He says it to a group of people who are experiencing exile. Their homeland has been invaded by enemies. Their villages have been burned. Their loved ones' lives have been taken away. And those that survived the siege were taken out of their homeland in chains and placed in foreign country. They are suppressed. They are oppressed. They are depressed. They are discouraged. They are disoriented. They are discombobulated. They feel like their whole life has fallen apart. And in the midst of this calamity and chaos, God tells Jeremiah to tell them, I got plans. I like it. Did you hear what I just said? I got plans. And he didn't tell him, watch this, what the plans were. He didn't say, you know the plans. He said, I know the plans. He says, tell them I've got plans, and I'm not going to tell them what the plans uh, are, but I'm going to tell them what the plans are like. I got plans to prosper them, not to harm them. Listen to this, and I got plans to give them a hope and a future, meaning that your current condition is not your future predicament, meaning that the way it is right now is not the way it's going to be. Meaning that this current season you in is not a period in the sentence of your life. It's a comma in the sentence of your life. And I'm telling somebody, God's getting ready to do something on the other side of the comma. People are looking at you one way now, but check me out after the comma. I'm crying right now, but watch me after the comma. I'm on my last leg right now, but watch me after the comma. Somebody open your mouth and say, it's comma season. It's, it's comma season. This is not the end for me. God's getting ready to transition me. 
He says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and plans to give you a future. And I want to talk to some people who may feel like you're experiencing your own metaphorical exile. You may not be experiencing a literal exile, but maybe you're experiencing a metaphorical exile. Well, you've experienced, watch this, this is what happened with exile. There were people that didn't survive the siege and there were people that survived it. Those that survived it were taken away and held captive in another land. Listen to me now. So they're grateful that they survived. Yet they still sense something's got to be better than this. And I want to know, have you ever felt conflicting emotions? where you felt like, God, I'm grateful for what you have done. I realized I survived some things that other people didn't survive. That I overcame some things that over people, other people didn't overcome. That I made it through some things that other people didn't make it out of. That I have come much further than I ever would have imagined. So God, I don't want to come off unappreciative. Yet if I'm honest, if I'm keeping it real with you, I'm grateful and frustrated at the same time. Am I talking to anybody online, anybody in the room? I'm grateful for where I am, but something on the inside of me keep telling me there's more. There's a longing on the inside of me. And God's like, yeah, that longing is I got plans. I got plans. I got plans, so I will never let you be comfortable in a place I don't intend for you to settle. <laughs> yeah, he said, because if I make you feel okay where you are, you will feel okay staying where you are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a divine agitation. I'm going to give you a holy frustration. And the frustration is an indication that where you are is not where you're going to be. Come on, come on. He says, I'm going to give you a want to. I'm going to give you the desires, uh, not just, watch this, desires of your heart. I'm not just going to give you what your heart wants. I'm going to give your heart what to want. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, he says some of the stuff you want I put the want to on the inside of you, but I know you can't get it for you just by me wanting it for you. I got to make you want it for yourself. So stop acting like you don't want it. Stop talking like you don't want it because it lacks integrity and authenticity. Just go ahead and admit, I want it. Why? Because some people don't want it. Some people are okay staying stuck. Some people are okay settling. But God put a want to on the inside of you. Because sometimes what you want is what he needs. Hannah wanted a baby. God needed a Samuel. I'm going to say it because I'm going to say it one more time. I want to make sure... Hannah wanted a baby. She thought she just wanted a baby, but God needed a Samuel. So some of the stuff God needs, he puts a want to on the inside of you so that when you produce what you want, you're producing what the earth needs. Now I'm trying to see if somebody just got set free from false humility, from spiritual self deprivation, and people that are honest enough to say, I want it. And I'm tired of acting like I don't want it. I'm tired of letting people talk me out of wanting it. If you don't want it, good for you. But don't you get in my way when I say I want everything God's got. Here it is. I'm going to see, I grew up in church. I know some of y'all didn't. I'm going to see the church go and see if you grew up in, I grew up in, I grew up in Sunday school church. I grew up in vacation Bible school church. I grew up, I saw that children's wing back there. I ain't grew up with that kind of church. Yeah, you sat in big church and you just hope one of the church mothers gave you a peppermint. Okay, let me, the, them were the original king.
Don't miss this. He got plans. And he gives you a want to for that. But there's something I need to tell you about the plans. I think everyone has to be faithful to who God's called you to be, your sense of that, and how God's called you to do it. I hope you feel inspired. I hope that gave you some inspiration. But if I stop at inspiration, I'm not fully being authentically me. I got to give you a little bit more than inspiration. I want to give you some information. Because there's something I think you need to know about plans. I'm going to say that one more time. I think there's something you need to know about God's plans. My question is, online, in the room, do you want to know it? Okay, come on. Online, I'm going to say that one more time. Online and in the room, do you want to know it? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm talking about you want to know it because you're getting ready to engage in extreme execution. Yes. I'm talking about you want to know it because you're in a season of your life where you're too old to play games. You're in a season of your life where you're wasting no more time experimenting. Do you want to know? Uh, 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 here it is. Some of God's plans are God's preferences. Darius, what do you mean? It means it's what he wants to do. It means it's what he's willing to do. It means it's what he commits to do. It means it's what he wants to happen for you. But he won't force it on you. See, see, here's some of the imagery the Bible uses to describe God is shepherd imagery. And the shepherd leads, but he doesn't force. He said, I want to take you to another level, but I can't force you there. I want to take your mind to another level, but I can't force you there. I want to take your heart to another level, but I can't force you there. I want to take your life to another level, but I can't force you there. He said, I love you so much, I won't even, but I won't even force salvation on you. I'm not willing that any should perish but, and that all would have everlasting life. But I won't even force salvation on you because I'm God enough to want you to go to the next level. But I respect your free will enough to let you live on whatever level you settle for. I want to know, did y'all hear what I just said? I want to know, am I talking to anybody that will say, my settling season is over? Darius, what you want? Everything that God's got for me. Somebody wave your hand at me and say everything, everything, everything. His, his plans require, some of his plans require our participation. What's the word that the Bible used to describe participation? Here's the word the Bible uses, faith. That, that's the word the Bible uses, faith. Our participation is an indication or an expression of our faith. Listen to me. Faith is not optimism. Faith produces optimism, but it's not optimism. You can be optimistic and not have faith. You can be optimistic and not even believe in a creator. Faith is not positive thinking. Faith affects our thinking, but we can have positive thinking and not have faith. Are y'all still here? If you're still here, say yes in the room. Come on. Okay, here it is. I hope I don't lose some of you here. Online, in the room, faith is not manifestation. Faith will produce manifestation. But the scriptures say this, faith without works is dead. 
that an indication of my faith is a corresponding action called works. So here's what Dr. Tony Evans says. He says, faith is acting like God is telling the truth. And this is why some people are confused about how calm you are in your crisis. They are worrying and wondering about how you are not stressed out, falling apart, and how you're cool, calm, and collected. They don't know you digging the scene with a faith lean. Whoop, whoop. They, they have no idea that I'm just acting like God's telling the truth. So the reason I'm praising God in the midst of my pain is because I'm acting like God is telling the truth. The reason I'm not losing my wits is because I'm acting like God is telling the truth. And here's the truth, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises in judgment, he shall condemn. Here's the truth, your enemy will come at you one way and flee seven ways. Here's the truth, God will do exceedingly and abundantly above all you ask or think. Here's the truth, you are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus that love you. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. And one of the most powerful examples of this is our story with Noah. I told y'all I'm Sunday school church. I'm vacation Bible school church. I grew up Baptist. I was Baptist training union church. I'm talking about church, church, church. I know Noah's Ark, but I saw something in preparation for this presentation that I'd never seen before. I saw, and I'm not going to get all into the reasons for the flood, that's, that's a bit of theological wrestling there and the redemptive nature of it. There is, though, some lessons we can pull from, the, from it, and time won't allow me to explore it. God looks at the human species and say, this is not operating in a way that's consistent with my original intent, so i got to start over. Because sometimes renovation requires demolition. Sometimes to get it right, you can't be scared to tear it down. If God started over, why don't you think you can't start over? Let me talk to this side. Let me talk to the camera. I said, if God started over, why don't you, why do you think your life is too far gone? It's too bleak. It's too messed up. If God can start all over again, you can start all over again. <laughs> Here, here it is. Y'all okay? I got 13 minutes. Everybody good? Okay. Here it is. Here it is. God sees this is not functioning according to my original intent. And scriptures say that a man named Noah found favor with God. And the favor expressed itself by God giving this man some inside information. I've been in church my whole life. I've never seen this. God tells Noah it's going to rain. And then tells Noah, this is what you got to do to survive. <laughs> what? God tells Noah, it's going to rain. And this is what you got to do to survive. I'm looking at this. I'm saying, you told him it was going to rain. And God... That's all you did. He said, that's not all I did, Darius. I told him it was going to rain. I told him what to build. I showed him how to build it. And I told him when to build it. I told him to build something that would protect him in the midst of the rain. I say, wait a minute, you're right. God told Noah to build the ark, and God didn't pick up one hammer. Oh my God. What are you saying, Darius? I'm saying, listen to me. Y'all ready for this? Some stuff that God sees for your life, his plans, he's the architect, but you're the general contractor. 
Y'all missed it. Let me. Do you understand? Our architect designed the building. Our architect showed us plans. Y'all missed it. The architect showed us plans of what it could be. Whether or not this building actually became what it could be wasn't just dependent on the architect. It wasn't just dependent on the blueprint. It was dependent on the builders. We had to build according to the blueprint. And what I'm telling you is that God is our architect and he's not put his plans for our life on paper. He's put his plans for our life on our heart. And if you're going to experience what you see in your heart, if you're going to walk in the God's plans, you're going to have to do some building. What do you see for your marriage? You got to build. What do you see for your mind? You got to build. What do you see for your parenting? You got to build. What do you see for your resources? You got to build. God gives the blueprint. We do the building. And I want to know, am I talking to anybody that's willing to say I'm building something? Here's this. Noah, as far as we know, has no experience in construction. He doesn't even know a builder is on the inside of him. Yet God puts him in a situation that puts a demand on a version of Noah that Noah didn't even know exists. I want to tell you, you don't even know you like you think you know you. There's an Israel inside of Jacob. There's an Abraham inside of Abram. There's a Sarah inside of a Sarah. I mean, there's a you that God wants to introduce you to that you ain't even met yet. Somebody say, hello. Who you talking to? Your stronger you, your wiser you, your bless you, your anointed you. Hello. Hello. I'm broken now, but hello. I'm weak now, but hello. I'm crying now, but hello. I'm confused now, but hello. Here it is. <laughs> he has no history in construction. And God said, you build it. Text, verse 14, you shall build an ark for yourself. I won't do this for you. I want this for you, but I won't do this for you. I'm going to say that one more time. I want this for you, but I won't do this for you. Ooh, and I can't wait to talk about this next week because some of our, here's what the enemy does. Oh, Lord, I, I can't get into the next week's message this week. But can I just give you this a little bit right here real quick? Yeah, because uh, um, um, here's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy, when the enemy, are y'all ready for this? Yeah. I said, y'all ready for this? Yeah. yeah, here's what the enemy, one way the devil shows up is through distractions. And so some of us are able to build. We want to build, but we've been fighting too many distractions to build. I'm telling you, it's building season. I'm telling you, if you see it, there's the ability in you to do it. And God puts a demand on the version of you that you hadn't met yet through giving you responsibility you hadn't had yet. Somebody say, I'm building something. I got seven minutes left. Don't hold all your amens to the good part. Here it is. Here it is, family. Listen to me. Listen to me. I think Noah's story doesn't just tell us or show us that we need to build. It also is a blueprint on what we need to build. And before I take my seat in seven minutes, can I give you five things that you're going to need if you're going to build whatever you're building? 
marriage, family, mind, ministry, business. Here it is. Here's the first thing Noah's story teaches us. Noah's story teaches us if I'm going to build, number one, I need truth. What's truth? It's reality. Jesus said, right, uh, John Mark Comer says, truth is what you run into when you're wrong. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? It's like, oh, I thought they were one way. They so nice and loving, and then all of a sudden you run into truth. I was wrong. <laughs> Jesus said, you know the truth, and the truth sets you free. So if truth sets you free, then the opposite must also be true. That when I'm living life and it's not according to truth, I'm bound. I'm limited. The first thing God gave Noah was truth. What did he tell him? It's going to rain. Noah, you might not like this news, but it's going to rain. And I know it's not a cloud in the sky right now, but a day's coming when it's going to rain. So I need you to build something now that will help you float in a flood. And that's not just God's word to Noah, that's God's word to you and me. I am telling you, it's gonna rain. That's the truth. What does rain represent in the Bible, Darius? It represents burdens, and at times it represents blessing. And Noah needed the truth that, listen, I know everything. I know the marriage. We love each other, PD. We just, you know, we just love each other. But what if it rained? Let me see how many old school I got in here. Can you stand the rain? Storms will come. This we know. Y'all not helping me preach. This we know for sure. We like each other. If somebody gets sick, can you stand the rain? If you gotta move a loved one, if you gotta move mama in, can you stand the rain? If one of you lose a job, can you stand the rain? If your children start making decisions that put stress on the family, can you stand the rain? When you believe it's going to rain, you build an ark. Say, I wanna build it so strong that when the flood come and other people drown, I'm floating. I feel that right there. When the next time somebody asks you how you doing, just tell them, floating. How you doing, floating? It's raining, but God's keeping my head above water. I'm floating. It's going to rain, I'll, I'll build an ark. You need truth. Y'all ready? Okay, number two, I need more than truth. I need tools. I need tools. And I don't need all the same tools. You can't build an ark without tools. So I don't need all tools in the same season. I need different tools for the season I'm in. All of us, does that make sense? When they were building this building, it was some tools they used after others. So the tools you need are based on the season you're in. See, some of you are in a sawing season. Dr. Darius, what, what do you mean sawing season? What do you use a saw for? You use a saw to cut some things off. Who am I preaching to, right? Yeah, what do you know? Yeah, this is a season where all I'm doing is cutting off negativity. I'm cutting off cynicism. I'm cutting off people that don't believe God. It's sowing season. I'm not stuck up. I'm just sowing. I'm not standoffish. I'm just sowing. I have not changed up on you. I just realized it's my season to cut some things off. And if I don't cut it, it won't be cut. Okay. Maybe you don't need, a, maybe you're not in sowing season. Maybe you. Maybe you need a hammer. 
What does a hammer do? A, a hammer, you apply pressure. With a hammer. And you're able to drive a nail into one item to another item to hold stuff together. See, some stuff will come together if you apply enough pressure. And some people getting ready to be sick of you. Because they thrown off by you now. And they have no idea. I hadn't even applied pressure. Oh, you, oh, you thrown off now. You wait till I get this hammer in my hand. We getting ready to apply some pressure. Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't need that. Maybe you need uh, a level. You're in level season. You're in a season, you, you realize, you know what? I've been unlevel too long. Here it is. What's this? It's one-sided. Let me talk to the camera because y'all not talking to me. I said it's one-sided. What's that mean? There's, it, it means you in seasons and situations and relationships where there are all withdrawals and no deposits. So it's emotionally bankrupting you. And you are not being selfish when you realize it's my season to level some things out. Because I'm no good for God. I'm no good for me. I'm no good for anybody else if I keep letting people make withdrawals and I don't get any deposits. This is my season to level some stuff out. Maybe some of you not in that season. Maybe you're in painting season. See? Paint. Are y'all ready for this? Make the same thing look like a new thing. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. When we bought this building, this building doesn't look like on the outside what it looked like when we bought it. We didn't change any brick. We just put a little paint on it. And now the same thing, an old thing, look like a new thing. Because God doesn't have to give you something new to do something new. Did you hear what I just said? I said God doesn't have to give you something new to do something new. Tario, I'm out of time. Let's get out of here. Here it is. I need tools. Number three, I need a team. I don't even have time to deal with this. Maybe I'll throw it in next week. Listen to me. Uh, our culture lives in extremes of either codependence or hyper-independence. And we got to be careful because we can use bad theology to justify hyper-independence. I don't need, I got God. I got God. When what you see biblically is biblically you see encouragement for what's called interdependence. It is a recognition that God is the only one that has all things within himself. So the apostle Paul describes it like body parts. He says somebody's an eye, somebody's an ear. Some, he's, he's saying God intentionally didn't give anybody everything. Make sense? And so Paul actually preaches against hyper-individualism in Corinth. Because we need a team. I got friends. That don't mean you got a team. That means you got company. Let me go to... Are y'all okay over here? I feel love right here, so let me go this side. I said... Just because I have friends doesn't mean I have a team. It may mean I got company. It may mean I got people to go to lunch with. It doesn't mean I got people to build with. I'm getting ready to pray this over your life. 
I'm praying that God will send you more than company, that God will send you co-workers, that he send you people to help you build, that he send you people that have what you don't have. Need a team, I'm done. You need timing. Here's what the text says. It says, when Noah completed the ark, the rain came. I'm going to say it one more time. When Noah completed the ark, the rain came. What does that mean, Darius? It means that God knew how long construction would take. So he told Noah to begin building in a season where they would be finished before the rain came. You don't know when it's going to rain. God does. And so he tells you to start building because he knows that heaven's going to open up at some point and the ark will need to be built. Several years ago, I felt like the Holy Spirit was nudging me. I need you to become more disciplined. I need you to become more disciplined. And honestly, I was one of the most disciplined people I knew. I felt like I was managing a lot at that time, but I need you to become, and it didn't make sense, more discipline. But God knew, he said, I'm gonna start raining campuses on you. I'm gonna start raining businesses on you. And you need to be able to manage your responsibility, reach your goals without destroying your soul. I need you to be able to build an empire without destroying your castle with your family. So that, Darius, is going to take discipline. In this season right now, it's a little too late for me to try to develop it if I ain't have it. This is a blessing that will feel like a great burden if I hadn't built into my life before it started raining. What's God tapping you on the shoulder, speaking to your heart about? I said that discipline, some of you, some of you, you grew up Pentecostal, so you had that Pentecostal face. I saw you. I said discipline, say, mm. Shabbat. <laughs> you felt that witness, didn't you? And I don't know what he's speaking to you about, but whatever he's nudging you about is because your future requires it. This is what I'm talking to you about now. Your future requires it. I know the date is going to rain. And here's the final one. You need tenacity. And that is the willingness to keep building with no clouds in the sky. I can't be, I want to be respectful so I, there, there's only a certain degree of vulnerability I can have. I can just say there were seasons in my life where my wife and I we're working and praying and doing our best and feeling like I'm not unappreciative, but God, I feel like in my heart that the harvest should be different than the seed that we're sowing. And it's very discouraging to work hard and not see harvest. It's demotivating. Why am I doing all of this just for that? And I'm talking to some people right now. This is an honest space. Just between you and God. And like PD, I feel that. I'm trying to be faith-filled. I'm trying to be enthusiastic. I'm trying to be optimistic. And pastor, there was a season that I was all of that. But I feel like these last few seasons I've been through took all of that out of me. I'm still standing, but it hasn't been easy. And I've been wrestling in my soul, saying, God, there's got to be more. I want to tell you, keep building. 
have the tenacity of Jacob that says, I will not let you go until you bless me. I'm telling you, rain is coming. I'm telling you, rain is coming. I'm telling you, I can see a cloud the size of a man's hand. I'm telling you, rain is coming. I don't know when it's coming, but I know God's faithful. I don't know how it's coming, but I know he makes good on his word. I don't know how it's coming, but I know David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. It's going to rain. And here's God's word to you. It's up from here. Somebody that receives that, put your hands together. It's up from here. So, Father, right now, I pray for each and every person online under the sound of my voice that's tired, fatigued. I pray for grace, enabling ability, inability, tenacity to endure to the end. We declare in the words of the biblical writer, weeping may endure for a night but joy is coming in the morning get your umbrellas ready it's getting ready to rain in jesus name amen clap your hands all over this house listen to me hey i want to thank you for watching and i want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos. All right, if this message bless you, do me a favor, share it with somebody else. I'll see you next time.